but I think we're going to get started, if we could. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, Happy New Year. Um, so real quick before I get started, I am going to um, give you a reminder from our friendly audiovisual people um, that new mics are here. Um, to avoid echoes, we need to turn them on and turn them off when you're done. So if we're having a conversation and it's me and Freeman on opposite sides of the table, <laughs> Not such a big deal, um, but if it's me and Maureen, um, then we start to echo off of each other's mics, so we just kind of need to be cognizant of turning them off if you're having a close conversation or if you've done your speaking and are going to be done for a while to just turn them off. There's a push button in the front of them, simple on and off. Um, and also, we don't need to eat these mics, which is really nice, so you can leave them at a nice distance and not feel like you have to have it in your face, practically in your mouth for it to pick up the audio. Um, so all that said, this is the um, January 9th, 2020, I can't believe I'm saying that, um, meeting of the district communications meeting at uh, committee at 6.30 p.m. in the Triton High School Library. Um, so I thank you all for taking the time to make this night. Um, I can say when we received the massive sheets of feedback and I don't I don't hesitate in saying that um I talked to Brian and he was like I'm gonna Grinch this like we're it's done we're done we're not doing anything more because there was just so much feedback in there but when we dug into it like I think it was good a lot of it was actually relatively minor some of it was explanatory where we just said to Desi hey look this is what we're doing and in a couple of cases they were like you're doing really well <laughs> um so that was good um so to just kind of walk you through what we, we heard from them is that um, they have a regional schools group. They do the initial um, review of kind of everything in the uh, a proposed amendment to a regional agreement. Um, they have worked um, in some cases, I think one of them has been there for 13 years. So they kind of know, um, they know a lot about regional agreements, but they also know their legal department. So they try to cover all of the legal stuff up front too. We do still have to go through one final DESE legal review, um, which is why we're kind of on a time frame now where we have to get things done by the end of January. So what they want to see is us to get um, a, a final copy with um, incorporating whatever we want to incorporate of their comments into it and get that back to them and then they'll have it back to us. I said, you know, by the absolute latest, we need to have it back by the middle of March to be able to get it off with the final budget and everything else that has to go into the warrants. Like, I know you guys need it then. So um, so we need it back by then. And they said, if you get it to us by the end of January, then no problem in getting our legal review done and getting that back to you in time. So that's where we're headed for. I didn't feel comfortable in that, although a lot of these are not groundbreaking, earth-shaking changes. There are a lot of them in just saying, we'll handle this in our regular meeting on the 29th. Um, I felt like it really made sense to set up this earlier one. And then if there are any unresolved questions, places where we need clarifications on language, things like that, we have a chance to go back to DESE, to go back to district legal counsel, to go wherever we need to go, get those clarifications. And if we need to do one quick review on the 29th to make sure that everything's all set before this goes back to DESE, we can have the chance to do that rather than try and put all our eggs in that um, January 29th basket. <clears throat> so um, if we can go around the table real quick and do introductions, um, that would be great. And then we'll kind of jump right in with Pledge of Allegiance and getting into the document itself. I'll, I'll try to keep, take as little of your time tonight as I can. So I'm Nurse Wallen. I chair the Triton Regional School Committee. Damon Jesperson, Newbury Selectman. <laughs> Paul Mayant, Newbury Finance Committee. Paul Lee's Triton School Committee. Larry White, Raleigh Finance Committee Chairman. Joe Perry, Raleigh. <laughs> Raleigh everything. Oh, yeah, on, the, <laughs> on the selectman. Peterson Silva Finance Committee, Raleigh. Neil Harrington, excuse me, town manager in Salisbury. Freeman Condon, Board of Selectmen, Salisbury. Mike Doyle, Selectman Newry. Alicia Greco, Board of Selectmen, Newberry. Brian Forget, Superintendent of Triton. Maureen Heffernan, School Committee. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And if we could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, the flags behind you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the new republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, so before we jump in real quick, um, just a couple of, of background things. Um, so 
when when I went and talked to Dusty initially, um, one of the big surprises for me was um, that they went and pulled our 2006 regional agreement, and the Commissioner of Education had not signed it. Yes. <clears throat> so I said to them, what does that mean to us? And they said, um, that means you're on the right track. Get your amended agreement done. <laughs> so, um, and signed. <laughs> yes. um, so apparently it, that wasn't unusual at that period of time. There was a set of years where the commissioner of education wasn't signing it. But technically that also means that legally the last one that we have on file, I believe, is 1993. As far as what would happen with that legally, I don't know because there was clearly not a habit of signing them even though they had been accepted by the Department of Education and filed by the Department of Education, but we're not going to test that. We're just going to hopefully get something done in the near future. Um, second of all, when Brian and I were trying to put together, pull Desi's comments into a document, um, it was confusing with the existing red line version that we already had. <clears throat> so what we opted to do was take the kind of finished version as of the last DCC meeting. So we took all of those changes that we had made between 2006, right, and our last set of discussions, and we accepted all those changes and worked from that as a base. So the only thing you're going to see in here is Desi's commentary, okay, basically. It's not going to include those changes, even though those changes would be changes that would be part of a, a regional agreement amendment. At some point, we're going to have to kind of fold that all together. <clears throat> um, yeah. So just to clarify, there's a couple spots where Desi's language actually edits language oh, yes. that we already edited. Yeah. But we're using our agreed starting point. So just to make sure that's clear. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'll just, um, this is something that Desi made very clear to us, was that there are certain things that they will require. So there are things that literally the Commissioner of Education will not sign off on it if we don't have certain legal references in there. But there's a lot of this that is absolutely up to us. <clears throat> and that was one thing that, that they had said to us again and again, was that this is the agreement between your towns that, that forms your district, right? So they can give us feedback, but a lot of what we take of that feedback and decide to incorporate in here is up to us, which is in a large part why we're having this discussion here tonight. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of jump right in and take you through these. I, it's a lot, so I'm hoping we can have discussion as we go through. So feel free. I'll try to look up in between. If there are questions, commentary, I mean, I need to come to some decision about whether we want to accept a lot of this or not. So um, I may be looking for feedback at certain points, but if you have questions or anything in between, jump in so that we don't get, you know, kind of lost. Um, so the first thing, the first note in there just um, notes one of the things that they said was that we define a lot of our terms. So it says, you know, right, the Triton Regional School District will, uh, school committee will be f uh, in the future known as the committee. The member, our Rally, towns of Raleigh, New Bray, and Salisbury will be known as the, the member towns. We don't use that consistently throughout the document. They just said for ease of understanding it and making it you know, nice and consistent, they would recommend us using that consistently throughout the document. So in a lot of places here, you'll see strike throughs that are literally just taking it down to those defined terms in the document itself. <clears throat> and the, the first note is just about that. Um, <clears throat> as part of the conversation, I apologize, I didn't add a comment in here. Um, I'm looking under 1A um, toward the end of that second paragraph in accordance with MGL Chapter 71. Um, so they said that we, we do need to reference the actual MGL for the elections, um, but they also noted that the election law calls for our um, elections to be done biennially. And they said, well, you know, back in the day, a lot of districts had legislations passed specifically for them that would allow them to have um, elections annually instead of biennially with the state elections. Um, thanks to Woman McDonald, who came through when Brian and I were having an absolute panic moment over this, oh my gosh, do we have special legislation? Um, she had an entire folder from the time that she was a town clerk um, that she fortunately was ready to photocopy and hand over to Brian. So Mindy, the um, town clerk, had now, and she was able to get it right to me. Yes, so it had all that information in here. So that Chapter 390 of the Acts and Resolves of 90, 1993, that's actually the reference that talks specifically about the Triton legislation that allows us to have our um, elections annually instead of biennially with the state yes <laughs> can I can I add one yeah. thing so just it's not commented in the note but right in the middle of that first paragraph it says to form oh yeah 
So that's actually a, a clarification in that the district only exists because of this agreement. So the, the agreement isn't between the towns and the district. The agreement is, in be, is with the towns to form the district. So that's a, I mean, it's semantics, but that's a pretty powerful change in regards to, um, I think as it flows through, it makes more sense that it's the three towns determining what makes sense for the district. Um, it's not, it, there's not four entities here. There's three entities that create the fourth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And good point. Um, moving down to the bottom of page one under the organization. Um, this is actually a requirement from Desi, so I'm just commenting that it's there. But um, they, we, they, we have the, by provision by law that we have to elect our officers at our first organizational meeting. Um, apparently a lot of districts also elect their district treasurer at the same time. We don't do that. We need to have, um, we do it annually or on the basis of the contract. Um, so they recommended that we add some, the, or not recommended, but told us to add the specific language that says that we, uh, the committee appoints the district treasurer on an annual basis or by multi-year contract as determined by the committee. So that's an addition there that, that they're requiring as part of the process. All right. Um, on top of page two, quorum, this is definitely a recommended, not a required. Um, they, they had two notes here. Um, one, that budgetary considerations is not very specific. Um, they said typically when you're seeing a requirement for a vote to be by two-thirds or majority, you want to see something really specific um, that would guide that um, rather than just budgetary considerations because that's pretty general. Um, the other thing that they noted is that um, there are situations both in mass general law and elsewhere in this contract, um, for instance, under the additional withdrawal of member towns to the district that require a two-thirds vote even though that's not a budgetary consideration. So their recommendation here, um, which personally I think makes sense, is that we strike for budgetary considerations and add by law or as stipulated elsewhere in this agreement for when a two-thirds majority or a two-thirds vote of the school committee is required. So this is where I'm going to throw yeah. it out and say, what do we think about that? Because, I mean, it's not a huge change, but it's a change. Okay, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up and no thumbs down. So, okay. Okay, so we're going to call that a... Yes, we're putting that in. Okay. Um, under Section E, Votes and Governance, um, so one of the things that Desi said to us a couple of different times when we were on a conference call with them and um, in some of the follow-up emails was that you need to look at your regional agreement as if you were reading it for the first time. So a lot of this is historical information. Um, it was put in the agreement because things had changed between the original agreement to 93 and from 93 to 2006 and then even coming into, you know, essentially modern times. So... Um, one of the things they said was this quote in here about any action voted requires a majority vote. That's just standard. There's no reason to have that in there. So it can stay if you want it to, but there's no reason to have it in there because that's just standard. It was probably put in there because at some point something else was required and it was changed to a majority vote, but the majority vote is standard, so you don't need to say it in there. Um, the second part of that, though, is... Um, kind of a concern that they had about the lack of definition of the word program. The word program was used in that language over and over again. And um, they said there's nothing anywhere, either in Mass General Law, the regional agreement itself, or um, school committee policy or anything like that, that denotes what a program is. Um, so they recommended tweaking that language, we pulled from um, several other regional agreements the language that's at the bottom that says closing an elementary school or reconfiguring or eliminating the grades in it within an elementary school shall require the <coughs> approval of two-thirds of the committee members from the affected town in addition to the approval of the committees or, or of the committee. So I'm going to throw it out there and say I don't know how you feel about that. I mean, I think their main concern was, and I'll, I'll try and put this, you know, in a real-life example, was if you're going to talk about eliminating a, a music program at a school, does that mean all of the music is going out of the school? Or does that mean that just the instrumental music coming out of the school or just the choral or just the music classes but not extra So what does that mean by definition of a program? There's no definition anywhere to determine what exactly would be the scope of that word. And I think this is one of the sections that was uh, amended 
in our most recent discussions, and it was actually the school committee that brought it up because um, the original language was that um, all members from an existing town had to vote to close a school or to take specific actions on specific programs. And the reality is the, the spirit was if eight of nine members want to take an action that's, uh, that's <laughs> beneficial to the district, then that, that doesn't work to have one member of the committee being able to hold up an entire decision that the majority of the committee for all three towns want to do. So that last piece about closing a uh, reconfiguration <laughs> or closing a school, that was really the kind of the crux of the discussion was if we're doing something major like that, then yes, we need at least two thirds of the, the members from that town of the impacted school to be have, to have an affirmative vote as well. But the, the rest, as Narissa said, was more kind of cleaning up from original language that spoke to setting things up at the onset. So everything except for closing an elementary school or reconfiguring or limiting the grades would require a majority vote? Is that yes. Yeah, Which as is far as statutory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can appreciate, keep it simple, right? <laughs> so is there a typo in this that says yeah. closing an elementary school or reconfiguring or eliminating the grades within the elementary school? Yes, it should be within. You're right. Okay. Actually, I think I read it that way and then. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Apologize for that. A lot of what they send us for sample text is a picture of the text, so I have to retype it. Um. So I, I don't know if you said this tonight. We've had so many conversations about this, but so when we were talking with the folks at DESE, the way they were explaining it, they basically said, okay, take this as if you haven't been working with this for years. Take this as, you know, picture someone 20 years from now. We're not the players. We're not, you know, committee and administrators. There's completely different players at the table. Make the agreement make sense. So it was, it's hard because, I mean, literally, there was probably at least three times the edits they have here. There was probably 100 edits in this window down. Um, but it's, it's helpful. It's a helper, helpful perspective to take a step back and say, okay, if you don't understand any of this, read it differently and try and simplify. I think when we were looking to modify, we were just looking to edit certain sections. They're saying, take this as, a, as an opportunity to truly modernize the agreement so it's, it's very clear and there's no questions, so. So I guess, does anyone have anything they want to specifically say about that section? Because this is one that Brian and I kind of were like, well, we don't know what's gonna happen with this yeah. one. Some of it seems sensical and some of it, you know. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna take it in two pieces then. And the first one is just that, um, that what they, it was basically, they believe it's redundant to general, mass general law. Um, that first comment, uh, or that first question, or first sentence uh, that's stricken that starts any action voted by the Regional District School Committee. Does anybody have problems with removing that from the agreement? The whole stricken part. Not the whole stricken part. I'm gonna take that in two pieces because I recognize that it's kind of two different things. Right? One is about clarifying language and one is about redundant um, information. All right. So I'm going to say yes, we'll remove that top. Does anybody have any, what do we want to do? Uh, maybe I should just say about that bottom part. Do we want to, I mean, we can go back and try and clarify programs or define programs if we want to get down to that level, or we can go with that kind of stock language that is in other regional agreements as far as what specifically requires that two-thirds vote of the committee members from that particular town that's being affected, that, that town's elementary school that's being affected. What was the purpose of the original language? Was it to prevent program closures? Yes. Generally? I think so. So my understanding was that there was a fear early on that two-thirds of the committee, six members, the, essentially the other two towns worth of members, could go and just say, well, we're gutting. There's going to be no librarian anymore, and uh, there's no music program or art program at X elementary school. And those members from that town basically couldn't do anything about that. Um, so what they had written in the original agreement was that you couldn't close or change, uh, was it change or reduce funding on a program um, without all three of the member towns committee members voting for that to happen. Um, when, we, when we talked about this in committee before, we said three out of three locks us up in some cases. So let's say it's two out of three that's still giving that member town a good number of specific votes on that action. Um, now Desi has said 
you know, they're not, I don't want to say fond of, but they're, they're concerned about the lack of clarity around the word programs, because that gets used in here quite a number of times. And they also, their also concern was, where is ground zero? Is it changes since 2006? Is it changes since 1993? Um, where are you kind of using the baseline for, you know, where that change is happening from as far as defunding something or changing something? Larry? Uh, yes, can any uh, school uh, expand or start new programs? What's the criteria for That'd be a starting general... a... Well, I guess it depends on whether it requires funding or not. So, I mean, most, pro, most, like a new curricula is a majority vote of the school committee. If it requires funding through the budget, though, then we're at a two-thirds vote because it's, a, you know, it's, it's the budget. So if it's requiring funding, then it's a, a budgetary vote, a financial vote that would require two-thirds. But, so, but so not from a specific town. the school committee town. can start as many programs as they want yeah. But to get rid of it, it takes not an act of Congress, but a much more <laughs> difficult. Yeah, to get rid of it at a specific elementary school. So the, the, the original language was very restrictive in that it was very broad, to your point, whereas now this confines it to collapsing a, a grade levels or closing a school. Everything else is part of the general committee yeah. process, which is it's a majority vote. If it's financial and budget related, it's a two thirds vote. And you know, if, if we develop a district wide program and it's housed at Newbury Elementary, kids from Salisbury, Pine Grove and Newbury are serviced at that program for special needs. That's a district program, but it doesn't it shouldn't take any special um, uh, you know, action or whatever, be the regional agreement to do that. That's a vote of the committee. If the agreement is fund or the uh, budget is funded, then we then we produce that or uh, start that program. Um, but this is trying to streamline it so that it's only those major decisions it's where we're closing a school. Too, right? Far more flexibility, and it's actually it's what we're doing now, right? It's it's. I mean, it's it's. We, we <laughs> yes. don't. We're not just opening and closing programs willy nilly, but when we're developing district programs. It's, there aren't programs that exist at each elementary that are unique to the schools unless it's a specific specialized program like the Autism Spectrum Disorder Program at Newbury Elementary. Right. So we have kids from all three elementaries at that program. So that's the way we've always done it. Again, this language dates back to 1993 when the district was formed, and it's speaking to we are three separate schools. How is this all going to work? How are we going to yeah. work together? So this is more speaking to oh gosh, this is scary to, get to start working together, whereas now we've been doing it for 27 years. I mean, program is a very broad term. I mean, I yes, it is. I about that. Yeah. It's not clear what, it, what a program is. So yep. no. In a way, the towns have more say than, you know, like for the elementary schools than you do for the middle and the, you know, high school level because you might have a town that might say, oh, we don't want a gut Italian, but, you know, the towns, you know, Salisbury may want to keep Italian. The other two towns, we say, no, nah, we don't want it. So you can, that can be gutted much easier than, you know, if it was just an elementary school that it was affecting. Yes. Which is kind of unfair, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, um, I'll try to make a generalized statement here, but I think uh, towns always feel much more proprietary about their elementary schools than they do about a regional middle school and high school because they exist in their schools towns and it's their youngest their youngest students typically um, which you know gender be the, the students that you're most concerned about in a lot of cases mm -hmm. and um, and a lot of times people are in those schools it, I mean it's oh. your I would say you're far more likely to be in Pine Grove for an event or something like that than you are to come here um, because Pine Grove is you know I mean that's where town meeting is right so you're there you know that school. You feel a sense of pride in that school because right, so it's right there. There's a lot more allegiance to the, the elementary schools, basically, than it is to the middle and high school. Yeah. Um, I think it's fine to adopt this. I don't think any of the towns are going to, you know, even if Salisbury and Newbury are fighting, I doubt Rowley and Newbury are going to get together and close their library. I think we can be done with this discussion <laughs> and move on now. We have a lot to get through. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> Okay. Is everyone okay with what Damon said? <laughs> Any yes. qualms about removing this? No? No? Okay. So we'll change that to the, um, the proposed language that's in there. 
Okay. Um, the next one down, <clears throat> that's uh, the organization. So this um, particular section was something that um, during our regional agreement review process was added by the former superintendent. Um, when we went to Dusty, they said, we don't understand what second tier is. <laughs> and we said, we don't really either. Don't either. <laughs> it's a British thing, apparently. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so their recommendation was that there are very specific um, administrative positions that are under school committee um, appointment in Mass General Law. They said, just let Mass General Law, law govern it. Don't worry about trying to define it yourselves. Um, so there's the addition, or um, it's all under um, MGL Chapter 71 which is already in there. They said just remove second tier and remove the other, um, the other reference and that will cover you for this section. Just to clarify what the law says, so the committee appoints the superintendent um, and the district treasurer. Those are appointments of the school committee and then they have to approve, hopefully next week, um, <laughs> the business official, uh, the special education administrator, anyone with the assistant superintendent title in his or her or name in, in his or her title, and actually school nurses, which is an obscure, no one does it, because it's an old, it's, yeah. it's a, one of those old hangovers from, I think, like the 1700s. Um, so just so you're clear, that's what the law basically says as far as the purview. The second tier, I believe what Christopher was going at, was the, the administrators that I recommend and the school committee has to ap approve or, or deny a recommendation, um, but just so that you're clear on what the law says, but that doesn't say it here. Um, yes, Paul? So I was just going to say, um, the beginning of that sentence where it says the regional school district. Yes, I should school, strike. That should be X'd out. Yes, yes, it should. You're right. It should come down to just the committee. Desi caught some of those. I caught some more. And then I'm still finding them as we go. <laughs> I'll say, I need that. Oh, oh, never mind. Okay. Um, the next section, the, um, the heading there, they just recommended um, striking the word school from the title of that section because it's the district, it's not a school in particular that's um, being identified under this section. So I'm going to assume there are no, no uh, objections to that since that's a fairly easy one. All right, um, moving on to the top of page three. Um, so there are a couple of big changes here in the first paragraph. So this would be section 3B. Um, so the first one is um, talk, it, so this section is about um, uh, uh, students within a particular town attending the elementary school in their town of residence, so where they live and where exceptions can be had to that. Um, so one of the exceptions was except in the case of emergency. Um, and it was as defined by the Regional District School Committee, we don't have a definition of emergency. <laughs> so I looked everywhere for it. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Don't go looking. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so Desi said it should really be, you know, obviously it's gonna be pretty obvious if there's an emergency that requires students to be moved to another school and that should be at the um, judgment of the superintendent at the time. They're gonna know that there's a problem where students have to be moved to another elementary school. So they recommended just striking as defined by the Regional District School Committee and not adding any additional clarification onto that particular item. Um, and then they, it further said um, children attending special education low incident uh, classes, regional magnet classes, or intra-district choice. Um, they recommended striking special education low incidence and regional magnet and putting in there just a very general district wide um, because they felt like it was so specific that it locked us into some very specific you know, programs where there may be a case where other programs could qualify where we might want to put them in a particular elementary school and have students attend that without having it fall into those particular categories. So they recommended widening that out. Um, and then interdistrict school choice, they um, asked us if we had a definition. We found that we did. It's um, actually defined in the school committee's policy manual. So this adds in, um, in accordance with district policy to, um, to basically indicate where that definition of interdistrict school choice is included. And interdistrict school choice, just to be, um, to clarify, is where a student from, for instance, Salisbury could attend elementary school and rally by choice not within the state school choice program, but just within the district itself. And just, just to further clarify what the policy says, is we enroll students on the priority of resident. I'm in Rowley, I go to Pine Grove, Salisbury SES. Um, then intra, so that if the first priority, if there was someone from Pine Grove that wanted to attend Salisbury Elementary, 
they would have priority over someone living in Amesbury, and then we would um, enroll out of district or inter district um, choice. The inter is where, when we say school choice, where there's five thousand dollars changing hands, that's when it's for coming from out of town. So, just so that you're clear, what the policy that it references says. Okay, so I'm going to take those three changes as a whole, the removal of the definition or the as defined for emergency, um, the um, change from the regional magnet in the special education, education to a district-wide, and the addition of in accordance with district policy. Any questions, problems? How are we feeling about that? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Thumbs up, thumbs up? Seeing lots of thumbs up, no thumbs down? All right, we'll go with all three of those then. Okay, um, moving on to the next uh, paragraph. Um, you'll see this in a couple of places throughout the agreement as well. They um, recommended that we update to present tense um, some of the language that was in here. So instead of saying the town of Newbury shall make the land and building presently known as Newbury Elementary available to the district, it shall continue to make um, as part of kind of updating this agreement from those, again, 1993 terms. Um, at the end of that paragraph, um, this was something that uh, was added in the agreement because of the arrangement that was had where the district took on the debt for Salisbury Elementary School originally. Um, so it, specifically, it was specific to Salisbury in saying that if Salisbury withdrew from Triton, from the district that Salisbury Elementary would be turned back over to Salisbury at that point. Um, they noted that we actually, that, that that would be true of any of our elementary schools in the district and it does not specify elsewhere in the agreement that that would happen for Newbury or Rowley. So they recommended, they actually gave us the choice of either including this in the withdrawing section or just in, um, taking the language that was already here existing in, in the place where it is and um, updating that so that it was when a member town withdraws from the district the school gets turned back over. It doesn't speak to ownership, right? We technically own Salisbury, but we're operating NES and PGS, so it's just a simple, as Anissa says, just we're turning it back, right? <coughs> thumbs up, thumbs down? Thumbs up, thumbs up? All right, lots of thumbs up. Excellent. Okay, uh, moving down to Section 5A. Um, this is the same language that previously was down below. So when we wrote the, the basic landlord-tenant um, clause, we put it down in the apportionment of capital costs section. Uh, Dusty's comment was it doesn't really belong there because it's not an apportionment of capital costs specifically. So t please take it and put it up, put it elsewhere. Um, so we elected, at least for now, to suggest that we remove the landlord-tenant um, title that was in front of it, take the language that was there and put it up in the classifications of cost section. So same language, no changes, just just moving it. Yep. Thumbs up, thumbs down, and we can move this elsewhere too. It just seemed logical. All right, thumbs up. We're going with it. What did, sorry, what did you take out? It's, so if you look on the next page, page four, um, you'll see the landlord-tenant agreement and it's stricken. It was under the definition of capital costs, and Desi felt like that was confusing. It looked like it, we had elementary school capital costs, secondary school capital costs, and the landlord-tenant agreement as a extra capital cost. So they recommended moving it elsewhere. Okay. So we're, we're, we picked a spot to move it to that seemed logical, and, um, and that was it. All right. So, so can I just say, so that would yep. be an example of um, that would – that you – how do I say this? In the final document that we'd be presenting to towns, that move wouldn't be seen because that's new language we proposed. Right. And now we're just moving it, right? So the, it wouldn't be double edited. It would just be shown as a new text now on page three. Mm -hmm. So that's what we were saying earlier where it's, there are things that we edited that are being edited again. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. All right. Um, page four under the <laughs> elementary school section for capital costs. Um, we had a long discussion with Desi about the arrangement with Salisbury Elementary. Um, they, and, and with the other elementary schools as well. They recommended adding a statement in here just to say that the payment for the debt is included in our budget, but it's the responsibility of the town of Salisbury. This was, again, one of those, if somebody comes along years down the road and says, you know, I don't understand, I'm looking at the budget and it's here, it looks like it should be a district responsibility, it still is the responsibility of the town of Salisbury, it's just included in the budget. So, clarification. Thumbs up, thumbs down. What are you talking about the, the debt 
for the construction of the school? Mm hmm. It's moot. Why is this even in here? It's already paid off. It is moot, but we're not removing that language because that would require turning the town of the so, turning Salisbury Elementary back over to the town of Salisbury, which I understand we didn't want to touch. I think it was part of the whole. It was part of the whole discussion about the ownership of Salisbury Elementary, and they felt like to paint again, picture none of the history, to paint the full picture of the process. We carried the debt, so if someone came in 20 years and was looking on our books and found the debt, but it was all assessed back to Salisbury, so it's just a clear picture of the current arrangement as it exists now. But there is no debt. I mean, they're currently, right. So that's a little confusing for us. Shouldn't that be in the past tense? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I mean, there was a was budgeted by the district and was paid for by the town of Salisbury or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I can bring that back to Jesse. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Okay. That sentence implies that there is debt in the present tense. Still, right? yeah. That's a good point. All right. Um, moving on to the next one, district wide. So this was one that Desi said. They, one of their, a lot of their comments were also, "You need to be forward thinking." Um, so it's hard to change a regional agreement, but um, obviously the district needs to be more flexible. I will say this right up front: we have no district wide capital costs right now. We have no intent in the immediate future to incur district wide capital costs. But what is happening out there is there are a lot of districts that have had um, significant hikes in their transportation contracts. Um, Burlington just had 26% increase, I think, in their, yes, in their transportation contracts. Some of those districts are looking at buying buses. We have no reason to believe that our current transportation contract is going to go up that much. We have no reason to believe that we're going to look at buying buses in the future, but they recommended that we consider language around potential district-wide capital costs to cover us in the future in case that came up down the road. So again, this is a take it, we, we can take it, we can leave it. It's just, it's just basically the same, the same yep. assessment methodology we use for the secondary school. We're just saying for something, if it weren't at the secondary school, anything we've ever talked about or done, whether it's a renovation on this campus or the stadium, falls under that secondary campus. But if we ever, as a committee in towns, decided that it was, like Marissa said, with the buses, it's just taking it out as a separate category because we, we say elementary, we say secondary. If there was ever something that was a district categorization, we don't have it explicitly listed. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so all this does really is just I define capital costs. It doesn't include yep. how to budget them. It just defines exactly. what the capital cost is. Exactly. And provides a, a method for apportioning and inc essentially includes it in the method for approving any other capital costs out there. Rather than us saying at some point, yep, we would love to save X amount of dollars over our current transportation contract by buying two buses or whatever the situation is and not having a method to do it. So this applies only to elementary schools, right? No, the district, this is a third category under capital costs. So if you look at it's 5B is capital costs and then it's broken out into secondary, elementary, and they suggested adding a third category district wide. Because they would be used for, and that's the reason why it's district wide. If it was a busing situation, they could be used for. But we typically do an, um, a middle school, high school run, and then the same bus goes and does an elementary school run. So it wouldn't be used for specifically elementary students or specifically secondary students. So further in the this agreement, does it talk about mm -hmm. apportioning the costs? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, this is we can take it, we can leave it. It's just a, like that, it was, it was their suggestion to at least consider it. Does anybody have? I don't see any real problems. I'm with okay it. with it. It changes nothing. Yeah. yeah. Anyone have qualms about it? No? Seeing none? Okay. Although question. Yeah? Should without limitation be separated out by commas? Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if that's in I don't know. It isn't elsewhere in here, and this was, you know, <clears throat> the, where we didn't have specific language in here, we asked for samples. Okay. So this exists elsewhere in other regional agreements, typically. Um, okay, so we're going to include that in there. All right, moving on. Um, so I, I just want to, yeah. I mean, why, I mean, I don't know, but this, without limitation, the cost of original equipment and furnish, furnishings for such buildings or additions, is that usually an issue that you have to put that language in there without limitations? I mean, do they actually do have limitations on? I don't know, but that's stock uh, language. It's, so it's the same language that we use above, and it's typical yeah. language throughout other regional agreements as well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I would assume you could put a limitation on it. We could say it's going to be split 60-40, but honestly, at this point, our money is your money. <laughs> so... <laughs> Again, this is just defining, right? The whole right. process to... Yeah. This is calling it a capital cost, and then what we would apportion, and whether the towns pass it, that's that whole... That's a whole other discussion. This okay. is just the definition. Okay. Um, moving on to the next um, set of edits, which is Section D. Um, a lot of what you're going to see in here was done. This is one of those where Dusty said, take the 30,000 foot view like you're brand new at this. Um, a lot of this is just kind of making it look nice and making it very understandable. So they suggested that we add in here, because it wasn't in here right now, um, headers, so essentially calling out capital cost apportionment and then the language for capital cost apportionment, calling out operating cost apportionment and then putting in the, the definition of operating cost apportionment. And then at the bottom um, of that section, adding in that the total assessment is basically capital plus operating. So they suggested that. So that's, that's one piece in there. And then the other big piece that's in here is um, the, the um, the agreement used language is language that was the total student foundation enrollment as of October 30, uh, of October 1st when it was calculating apportionment. That's really not anything to Desi. They said that could be one of any number of numbers. We've always used foundation enrollment. They said use the use the term for what you use. Basically, they know what foundation enrollment is. There's a definition, but from the state already on what foundation enrollment is. It's the number we get that guides our chapter 70. Um, it's the number that we've always used for calculating apportionment. So they said just strike that total student enrollment um, and put in foundation enrollment instead. Are the terms different? I mean, how, in any way? <coughs> they said total student enrollment really could be one of any three numbers. So we talk about, for instance, um, the children that are in, in the schools, right? So that's one type of enrollment. And then um, for foundation enrollment, we're also including students that live in our towns but attend other schools that we essentially pay for out of Triton's budget, whether that be school choice students, whether that be charter students, um, you know, wherever they're going that's included in foundation enrollment because we pay out for them even though they're not actually here in the district. Um, so I, I think there's a, is there another type so, too? I feel like they said there was one more that. So back at what, 2012, 13, we went through that transition where um, we've had uh, several historical ways to count the in student enrollment to calculate the assessments for the towns. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to say it was back around 2012, we started, we transitioned to foundation because there were, you know, two times, two times, you know, pre, preschool um, numbers for um, foundation as far as, or special ed preschool, two times special ed count for preschool. So there's all these different cal calculations that the state uses. We were using a kind of a students and seats count, but that didn't capture all the students who were being charged for, as Narissa said, through choice, through charter. And so I believe it was 2012, we said, okay, look, we, we keep creating these numbers and no one can ever say, okay, this is the number and find it anywhere on the state, on DESE's website. So we said, can we all agree that foundation is an accurate count for the number of students that a town is responsible for in the budget? And we all were like, absolutely. So at that point we switched and what it did is it actually Foundation is a slight different calculation. Kindergarten students 
aren't a 1.0, they're a 0.5, because that's compulsory. That's so it just, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it deflates the numbers, but it deflates everyone's numbers commensurately. So the numbers kind of took a little shift down, but that wasn't an actual decrease in population. That was that shift to foundation. And we've used foundation for eight, nine so years So this is now. not a change in practice? In None of this section. Whether the assessment portion, the uh, formula, that last section that they said to add in, that your assessment is actually your operating plus your capital. It's the way your town warrants read. It doesn't just operating, it's operating and capital. It's one loaded number. So literally this entire section, all it does is provide some clarification about how we're actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And the, the last change that's in here is um, removing in that first section about capital cost apportionment in each town paying said percentage of the amount so approved. Um, Desi noted that it's not approved at that point. It's, this is just about the apportionment. So they suggested removing that one because that's, you know, that, that, that approval process is essentially happening after the apportionment process. We can't say at this point that that approval is going to happen. That's happening at town meetings. Right. Right. What about taking out October 1? Shouldn't there be a, a date? I mean. That is foundation. Huh? Foundation yeah. okay. is By its definition. own time frame. Okay. It's the number, it's the number that I still can't get from the state, but we will have, <laughs> we will have on January 22nd when the governor publishes his budget. That's the first time we'll get to see, because we're a region, the way it's calculated. All the numbers that it's a count as of October 1st, we got our choice numbers as of like just before the holidays. So all of that is just coming through now, but it's an October 1 count. So. Yes. Um, if you uh, could go back on that page, page yep. 4, to the bolded number B that's been crossed out. B. It says landlord tenant agreement. Yes. There's a comment on the right that says language is moved to section 5A. Yes. If you look at 5A, it doesn't say landlord tenant agreement. It just starts in order to clarify. Yes. They suggested removing that header because they felt like it made okay. it stand out separately. Fine. Okay. I just want to, so yep. it's not moved in its entirety. They, yes. It's moved and edited. Sorry. Okay. Good point. Not a problem. Okay. Any. I guess I'll, I'll try to take this as a, as a whole, since it seems like we've kind of questioned a lot of it as we go through. For section 5D, are there any qualms with change, making the changes that are indicated? Larry? I just have one comment. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> right at, after the total calculation, I have a single bullet with nothing by it, and I don't know whether that was. That's markup. That's this is in red line version. So if you it, have you used red line before, it's it's you can't delete that without <laughs> undoing the showing the edit that's there. And so, I think that's actually crossed out. I think it's got a line through it, but <laughs> yeah. So when you do final document, yes, it is really all nice. of these comments and lines disappear, and it's nice and neat. Yeah, and I said this to Ryan, like, Promise. we're going to end up, it's, some of this is going to end up, the formatting is going to end up looking funky when we just go through and, and um, accept these changes or, or decline these changes. So we're going to have to do some just changing the indentations, stuff like that. It's just going to have so to happen So when we get there, point. we'll do the same thing we did last time. Here's the yep. marked up. Here's what it looks like when you accept all the edits and show the clean line without random bullets that are struck through and I promise Larry I promise yeah. <laughs> Brian okay. Brian, Brian. Brian. <laughs> Brian January 9th 7:23 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> exactly all right um, on page 5 section E um, uh, we needed to reflect MGL this was one of their required ones um, by inserting by the district treasurer as far as the um, the p person that's during the certification of the um, apportionment amounts all right um, at the bottom of that page this was just a language simplification so including the amounts payable under they recommended using the words reflective of instead and um, removing the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and putting in DESI as their um, their abbreviation mm -hmm. so, um, moving on to the top of page six um, the state is big on becoming gender, gender neutral because a lot of towns are moving that way, even if our towns aren't moving that way. So <laughs> yet, maybe, maybe yet. Um, so they recommended striking chairman and putting in chairperson in those um, situations, in instances where they occurred in the 
agreement. Uh, so that's there. And they also recommended, since we have one town manager and two town administrators across the three towns, that we specify town manager slash administrator in here. Suggestions? Do we have any qualms with this? No? Okay. Seeing none, we will include that as well. <clears throat> All right. Um, under section B, um, they recommended, now that we've added the... Um, the statement at the beginning about where a two-thirds vote is required being indicated later in the agreement. They recommended adding the requirement for a two-thirds vote here. Um, and then they, oh, they, yes. Um, the section down that starts said budget further include debt and interest charges, that's already in section um, 5E and 6A, so it's redundant. So they recommended removing it here. And, sorry, also adding administrator down the bottom since we have town manager there already. Any qualms about that section? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Uh, seeing a lot of thumbs up? All right. We'll go with those. Um, under certificate of, uh, certification of apportionment, they recommended striking of the net budget. They said, what is a net budget? We said, we don't know. <laughs> they said, we don't either. Um, <laughs> so they recommended um, striking that in there just for clarification purposes. Um, section 7, insurance. This is a, a note. Um, so they said this should be in your lease agreement. And we said we don't have lease agreements yet. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> they I said, said I agree. <laughs> they said, well, when you get a lease agreement, um, this section should move to the lease agreement. And we said, okay, we'll let everybody know that that's the case. Um, section 8, indemnity. So just to clarify, we're not suggesting doing anything with that because in lacking a lease agreement, it still belongs in our regional agreement. It's just a note to say down the road, potentially that would move. Um, chapter, uh, section eight is indemnity. Um, so this is one that we had quite a long discussion on. Um, the language being here, they said, is legally fine. There's nothing illegal about including it. They also said that it's not a necessary part of the regional agreement and it's not a standard part of the regional agreement. So it can stay or we can remove it. They. You know, it was one of those, it was suggested that we remove it just for the sake of clarity and kind of standardizing, but we don't have to. So we said we'd put it out there and see how people felt. So this is in the current agreement is what you're saying? This is in the current agreement, yep. The fire section is in, on insurance is in the current agreement. Yes, they are both in the current agreement. They've been since at least 1993, possibly before that. This is original language. So that was what's, the original agreement. what happens if we remove it? What, what effect is that on the three towns? Mass general law governs it. So it's redundant. So it's a redundancy. Right? It's effectively redundant, but not within the agreement, right? This isn't covered elsewhere in the agreement. It's, it's covered with mass general law. I, I will fully admit I don't understand why they specifically say sometimes we need to include snippets of mass general law and why we don't, but, um, you know. This is something that they felt, you know, wasn't required, but we can keep it if we want, essentially. Strong opinions? Brian's going to hop in? Yes, I always have strong <laughs> opinions. Um, so I guess this is one of the things where, you know, in all these discussions, I feel like indemnity, that people, when we talk indemnity and liabilities, people kind of oh, bristle a little bit. So my thought is, if it's not... And, and this is not Desi legal we're working with yet. These are folks who know regional agreements inside and out and work with legal. But they said they don't believe that le uh, legal will have an issue with this. So I guess my stance was if, if it's not causing any issue and it's basically saying, look, if anything happens, the district isn't going to hold the towns harmless. The towns aren't going to hold the district harmless if anything happens. And it's not doing any damage. Let's just leave it alone yeah, because exactly. I feel like it's one of those things where we're saying, why would you take it out? It sounds like it's protecting all the parties. So I think if you take it out, we're going to have to refer to our town councils too. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. They yeah. And, yeah. and then if, if the legal, if legal has. <laughs> shut it off. What? You have to shut it off after you talk. I'm on. New world. <laughs> um, so then if, if. It goes when it goes back to the Desi Legal. If they have a concern, they would tell us. They would. Yeah. But so again, so um, Chris Lynch, who, if Jay Sullivan is the godfather of finance, 
then she is the godmother of the regional schools in the state. So, I mean, she has worked with Desi Legal forever on this, and she said she would be shocked if they had an issue with it. So I don't, I don't think there, I mean, we're all pretty confident that there wouldn't be an issue. Right, and all our town councils have looked at this, and they want it in there. Good point, yes. Well, they, said, they said they had no problem with it. So yes. I don't know if they do want it in there. Right. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. didn't say re right. remove it. Right. They approved it with that so language in know. there. We'd have, yeah. to, we'd have to send it back. Yeah. 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 So is that a keep it as it is? Yeah. You notice we didn't redline it. I was kind of anticipating <laughs> that would be the answer. So, um, <laughs> all right. So we're keeping that in... Uh, so section nine, transportation, um, you remember in previously in the apportionment section that we clarified operating costs, capital costs, all that stuff and laid out the steps. This is just um, a clarification on where transportation costs get handled in that. Oh, Brian's got a comment. Go ahead. I was on a roll. <laughs> so, go ahead. so there is some, so legally transportation costs have to be separate from your operating costs. Right? So in a regional agreement or in a regional um, district, um, your transportation costs can't be part of your minimum local contribution. Right? So back in the days when the foundation formula really worked and actual costs were mirrored in the formula, we had to worry about that because minimum town, town's minimum local contributions were pretty similar to what the assessments were. So transportation had to actually be calculated and, ass and assessed separately. If you want a history lesson, we can go back and show you some of those 1993 budgets that like five pages, all the numbers in five pages. Now you get 50. Um, but just so that that's clear, it has to very explicitly say it's in step two of the calculation because it cannot be paid within your minimum local contribution. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be separate anymore because we're spending 11 and a half million above the minimum locals. Right. So this is not a change of practice either? No. Nope. It is not. But it is supposed to, our agreement is supposed to state <coughs> that transportation is separate. It doesn't say the words transportation is separate, but it says it's step two, which is that amount above minimum. Yeah. So it was missing language. That does illegal would make us do. Yes. All right. Um, so the next piece is under section, what is this? Um, 10B, the amendment section. Um, so you're actually going to see this in the next set of language a couple of times um, where MGL requires that the commissioner of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education approve stuff. And when he approves things to, to make a change, you have to change it on July 1st. And it cannot be changed unless the commissioner has approved it by December 31st of the year before. So this is going to be a couple of places in there. It's required by MGL, but those are those two changes that are right there. Of the year before. Of the year before, right. So, You'd so essentially, it. one of the towns, this, we decide to add a new town, right? We, um, we could submit it. He could approve it October 31st and the fo following July 1st, we'd be good to go. If he approves it on January 29th, we have to wait another full calendar year. Um, to come to the next July before <laughs> that would actually go into effect. However, just to say, to clarify, so similar to not wanting to own our own buses, we are not looking for other towns to join the region. <laughs> <laughs> putting it out there. It's just language. Because honestly, three of you are enough. <laughs> 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 just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> did you have a question, Neil? I did. I'm sorry, yeah. can you go back to section nine for a second? Section nine, yes. Yep. How are the costs <coughs> oh, yeah. apportioned? I'm sorry. How are the costs for transportation apportioned to the member towns? The same way any other operating cost would be. So it in uses the two step method. But, but in, in, oh, in yes, step two. In step two. So right now, because you each pay your minimum local, and then there's $11.5 million that's above the town's minimum local contributions because the foundation formula is so bent. Our transportation costs are whatever the number is, 1.4 or $5 million. So because the 1.5 is less than 11.5, we can say that's part of. So right now we don't separate the transportation costs and assess them separately. If the town assessments were at or near the minimum local contributions, we would have to 
to have an operating budget. Right. And then we would have to have a transportation separate, which would basically be step two, which is enrollment. So it would be similar to a capital assessment. But right now, because there's so much capacity and that's that amount above minimum, it's just, it's all part of that. So now it's, it's line 3300 in the general budget. It's a general district-wide operating cost factored into the total 40 whatever million dollar budget. So is, how much is yeah. the minimum? And then the aggregate about 30 million or something close to that? We're 11, with this, this year we're 11.5 and change above the minimum local contributions. But the minimum is how much, about 30 million altogether? Yeah, we're about 42, yeah, right. yeah. Okay. 41. Yeah. So the busing portion, transportation takes almost about 10% of the total dollars that are over the, uh, that are, you know, that are above the minimum level. So the busing takes about 10%. But the here. transportation charges you said were about 1.5 1. About 1. 1. million. 1. 1.5 million. Yeah. So right now they're not anywhere. They're right, part of the total pot. Anywhere, but that's, they all get pushed. Yeah. In that we would have to separate, I mean, yeah. by law, you have to assess them separately right. so that you can, you can make sure that it's, it's um, not being charged to the minimum local. But because we're so far above the minimum local, it's all lumped into the same, which is I, the vast majority of what regions are doing now. We can go back and do separate calculation. It's just, it wouldn't do anything differently What's the assessed at step two? Um, so uh, I didn't bring a copy of the budget. So step one is everyone pays their minimum. Step two is if the budget's for ease, if the budget's 40, combined everyone's minimum is 30, there's 10 million that has to be assessed to each to the towns for the, for the amount over everyone's minimum. So if everyone's minimum was 10 million, and then, oh, look at this. So this is actually page, so is this the adjusted? No, this is the March budget, so it's right there. So it's page, not that you have a copy so you can see it. So it's, it's page 15 of the budget. So it's the total amount of the budget, 42.47, revenue in 10 million bucks. So 32 is getting assessed to the towns. Newbury's minimum is six, just over 6 million. Raleigh's is 6.8 million. Salisbury's is close to 8.2 million. The collective is $21.038 million. The 32 that we have to assess you minus your minimums is $11.5 million over. So then we take that 11.5, Newbury has to pay 28.8% of it, Rowley pays 32.3% of it, Salisbury pays 38.9% of it, and then your assessment is your minimum. So Newbury's assessment is $6,060,000 plus their amount of that, their 28.8% of that 11.5 million, 3.3 million, so their assessment is 9.38 million. Step two is the calculation of based on enrollment. And I understand that, but what is, how, I'm not clear as to how transportation costs, it says school transportation shall be provided by the district and the cost thereof shall be apportioned to the member towns as an operating cost in step two. Right. So right now we're satisfying that because there's $11.5 million being apportioned in step two. If, the, if transportation was 1.5 and there was only 500,000 happening, being uh, apportioned by step two, we would have to do a third calculation. So we would do operating and then transportation and then capital. So because the, the total number over foundation absorbs Cost kind of absorbs the cost of transportation. I would say because it's bigger than, okay, yeah, because it's greater than, yeah, transportation. Yep. Then we don't have to calculate it separately. We can. It's already. Yeah. It's. I mean, I, it's literally. It would be semantics, and it would be the exact same number. Um, it's just. There's no difference. It, there's no difference. But, An, but it's. In, are you saying it's embedded in? The calculation above the foundation? It's by statute, transportation costs can't be paid by your minimum locals. Oh, I understand. So that's the only difference. The only thing we're trying to satisfy here is it's got to be, it has to be able to be said that it was part of your step two calculation. Mm -hmm. So if everyone's comfortable, we're more comfortable with having it as a separate calculation, we can go, I don't I think it's probably been since 90, early 90, mid 90s since it was calculated that way. Um, but that could be, could easily change that and show it that way. 
it wouldn't. No, I'm just trying to explain how I'm trying to understand how it's done. That's all. Yeah. I don't yeah. So it's not. I don't it's, need a separate calculation. Yeah. So it's not. Um, we. So again, the, the the statute basically says that for regional transportation, it's above and beyond your minimum. So this is for those. There are there are regions where towns are funding them at their minimum local contribution. So if operating a district is twenty million dollars in minimum locals, is that's what that's paying and then there's transportation for a million and a half on top of that, then that's separate. So the towns can assess that separately. Okay, your minimums are to the educate, but we also have to transport our kids here too. So it's then, then there's a requirement to do both portions. Because of where we're at, and I don't know the number, and the rest of you probably know more than talking to regions, vast majority of regions are spending so, districts, forget about regions, are spending so far above minimum it's just a moot point because it's the numbers there. Right. So if step two is based on foundation enrollment. Correct. All right. So we're at 38% or whatever in Salisbury. Then our embedded transportation costs are 38% of the total transportation cost. Yes. Okay. Yep. So then, what, so then why when we get transportation reimbursement from the state, why isn't that Apportioned the same way. Why is it netted off the budget in a lump sum? So why? Um, so that's that's the way the formula is required. So it's if it's not. I don't see anything in the formula here about state aid. How right. That, so that would be that would either be could that be regional agreement? I suppose that could be regional agreement where. Um, so it'd be the same thing for Chapter 70, right? So it's the same when I mean, we've had the discussion, Roger Hatchew and I had the discussion about um, how state aid comes in and the way that DESE um, disseminates or portions or pays out any of their aid, they see us as a collective entity. Right. When you regionalize, we are right. DESE code 0773. <laughs> the three town schools cease to exist as far as, far as DESE is concerned. And our funding, our um, we're just having this discussion in regards to the backside of the formula of how foundation enrollment is counted and how um, all of the factors, foundation budgets, how they're calculated in the backside of the budget. Um, it's going to throw, the Student Opportunity Act is going to throw everyone's minimum way high. If it was done town by town, we could be back in this scenario. <laughs> But it, it doesn't. It's, it, it would inflate collectively. It inflates the foundation budget for the entire district. So all of the calculations are done as an entity, not as an individual. So because the, the costs, right, so the costs for transportation are not apportioned by, are not um, accurately budgeted by town, right? So we don't say we have eight buses at Salisbury, um, seven in Rowley and six in Newry. We don't, that's not how it's, it's, it's a district collective cost. Um, so I guess, so the answer to your question is, could it? I, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it could. I mean, you see his point. I do, yeah. absolutely, yeah. I can say we'd have to double check on that probably too because um, you'll see when we get down to the bottom, the very end of the, the agreement that, um, there were sections in there previously that uh, talked about state grants and federal grants, and their comment was MGL guides the way that state grants are done. So you, we cannot override that in our regional agreement. It's by it has to be by Mass General Law the way that it's stipulated there. I don't have a problem with that. Um, so they may have there may be something in MGL as well that um, that specifically handles this. I don't know. I've never gotten into that piece of regional transportation to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a regional funding, right? So I guess I, I, don't, I don't think the state would have, or probably MGL, would say anything about how it's apportioned within a regional school because the, the vast majority of, outside of 71, the vast majority of laws in the Commonwealth don't understand regional schools. <laughs> They're just completely agnostic. Um, but by netting, by netting state aid and school bus uh, transportation reimbursement, as lump sums from the th total budget, mm -hmm. you're in effect apportioning it equally among the three communities. Um, not necessarily because if, 
if we're spending 11 and a half above everyone's minimum, right? So I gotta close my eyes so I can do this. If we're spending 11 and a half above minimum. If, if I round it for a million dollars, if we got a million in regional transportation, a million comes off of that. You would have paid, you, Salisbury would have paid 380 some odd thousand of that. Rowley 320,000 and Newbury 290,000. So in essence, you got more of that because the net's the same, right? The budget dropped a million. Your assessment dropped 380, is that what I said? 380,000, 320,000, and 290,000. So I think because, because the entirety of those amounts are in that step two for ease, I, I, don't, I don't think that effect is true. I think as the money comes in, it's, it's all apportioned on enrollment at that point. And so when it's apportioned on enrollment, it's absolutely, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, I, I don't use the word fair, right? We're not gonna define that, but it's a fair, it's a, um, it's a comparable effect. Minimum local contributions, right? The whole thing we've wanted to say is the less, the whole basis of our um, discussion about an alternative assessment, the less we rely on minimum contributions and the more we rely on enrollments, the more we're controlling our own fate, the bigger the portion you are of the district, the bigger portion that you receive of state aid, basically, and, and then the, the costs offset there. When it's minimum local, that's all based on enrollment plus equalized valuation plus um, uh, aggregate Income. wealth. Yeah. Okay. I see your point. I totally get it. But I think where we're at... That's not to say I completely agree with the formula, but I think where the formula is at right now, because we're in that above minimum, I think it actually, it's a, it's a zero zero effect. A zero sum. Yeah, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I, I just curious about how the transportation costs are apportioned. That's yeah. all. I don't want to go beyond that too, too okay. much further. This point. Okay. All, right. all right, that puts us on page nine. Section 12B, oh no, sorry, 12A. Um, so this is a cautionary tale from another district. Apparently there was a district that had a withdrawing town and um, the withdrawing town withdrew, so handled capital costs in the operating, the you know, at least in the in the in between the the immediate operating costs, um, they left the OPEB liability on the other towns in the that remained in the district. So Desi very, very strongly recommends um, putting in this language that would make a withdrawing town also um, <coughs> accountable for other liabilities incurred during the time that they were a member of the district, including OPEB and other um, pension liabilities, anything along that line. And that's a roughly $80 million liability. Not small. To me. Okay. <laughs> this is this is one where we're pretty sure we're good. Anybody this is where have everyone looks out for themselves right here at the table, folks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, moving on, the next two changes are in accordance with MGL. We need to have a um, a statement in there about the town meeting majority vote approvals, and we needed to have the statement in there about um, the commissioners' approval by December thirty first. Means that it happens on the following July the first. Um, so that's in section B. Um, in section D, this language or this um, this particular number about where those costs or, or where those payments toward capital costs go from a withdrawing town um, in between the time that the town leaves and when the district needs them is legacy. They don't have an opinion here. They just said you might want to reconsider because the five million dollars that you're acquiring from that bank is a 1993 number. Um, so consider whether you want to increase that number to be more of a 2020 number. So I can tell you in talking to our treasurer today, hours ago, um, so again, this is, this is, the way it reads is, shall be deposited, deposited in trust in the name of the district with a Massachusetts bank or trust having a combined capital and surplus of not less than $5 million. So this is speaking to the size of the bank, right? We're not, we're not putting this at Bob's money hut down the road. Um, so I can tell you for comparison, Newburyport Bank is about a $110 million bank. Institution for Savings is about a $400 million bank. According to these calculations, Eastern Bank is about a $1.5 billion bank. So 
Not total, <laughs> right? So we're, we're talking about this, this calculation here, we're talking about um, combined capital and surplus, right? So it's capital, so it's, it's on hand, right? So this is the, so just to, to um, if we were gonna want to increase it, certainly five million still appears, as Desi said, in quite a few. Yes, um, yeah. so but, we'll just choose not to change it. You know, to put, to put half a billion dollars, that's not out of question. I mean, there's certainly very good banks if, if one of the three towns. So basically what this is saying is if one of the three towns um, secedes from the union mm -hmm. and is going to pay their liability, again, which, you know, OPEB is 80, so someone's coming up with $30 million, $27 million, that has to be on deposit with a reputable bank. So if we were to say $500 million, that's not unreasonable. Um, and... That's, that's the decision of the towns as far as uh, um, what you want to have. A billion dollars wouldn't be unreasonable, given where we're at. So. Hmm. It, it's also not earth-changing to leave it alone. Yeah. Dear God, I hope it's not earth-changing, because I hope no one's leaving. Uh, <laughs> right? So This is kind of a moot point, because yeah. I got no sense from any of the towns that they're about to leave. Yeah. Newbury's yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I hearing about for better or worse? <laughs> so do you want to leave it at five million? Does want someone offer something bigger? I mean, we do business with it's not Eastern. An <laughs> we literally, yeah, we literally do. In, we do business with Institution for Savings and Eastern Bank right now. So. Yeah, what do you think? So this this is only applies to indebtedness, correct? Mm-hmm. Size, size of the bank. No, but the five million dollars payment of certain capital costs by withdrawing town it only applies to remaining indebtedness. Yep. Affiliated with that. With withdrawal. Yeah. Yeah. Including the OPEP, which would be about twenty-seven million. Well, we're down on section D, are we not? Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. Five million's good. We like five million. All we right. like five million. Five million? Don't poke the bear. Yeah, don't poke the bear, exactly. Don't worry. We'll take care of the money. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on to page 10. Um, <laughs> it says in yeah. not less than five million, so it does cover it. Yeah, yeah it oh, could yeah. be more. Yeah. Any, I mean, yes. All right, um, moving on to section 13. Um, despite their extensive use of the word pupils um, in pretty much everything they do, Desi asked or recommended that we update um, pupils to students because it's more modern language. This is one where we can <laughs> keep it or leave it. <laughs> everything else Desi does is pupil. Uh-huh, <laughs> yep, per pupil expenditures. I mean, everything is pupils, but they'd apparently like us to be more modern even though they maintain it's their- because they uh, can't be. Yes. They're just jealous. <laughs> I think we should switch it to pupae because it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have an issue with changing it to students? Good. We'll modernize it. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, they just uh, put a note in here where um, vocational and the trade school students in here, um, there's cases where the member town is not decided by where a student's actually residing at the time because of homeless, because of, um, oh gosh, who knows what, I mean, I'm trying to think of, homeless is the big one, mm -hmm. right, or and DCF then, custody, yeah. something like that. They're not actually residing in their towns. We were the last town of residence, so they recommended here, putting in here um, where the town resides, where the student resides, or where otherwise determined by law to just cover those situations. Um, more pupils than students. That's about it. Okay. Um, down at the bottom of page 10 under the communication committee. <laughs> they were very curious about this. Um, <laughs> so <a> <laughs> in the, um, in the latest language set of language that we've been working on, we had updated it to say that the committee would be chaired by the chairperson of the school committee or the chairperson of the town member of a member town's board of selectmen, they said, how do you decide who's the chair? And we said, we rotate it. And they said, put it in there. So um, that's where on a rotating basis is coming from. 
They said we don't have to be really specific because it's not a public body as defined by law, but we should have something in there just in case somewhere down the road someone's looking at this for guidance. Um, they recommended a clarification in, in here of at least one select person, at least one finance committee member, so that we're very, very specific about finance. Um, town managers and administrators to make sure that those are both covered. Um, and that was it. So any qualms or questions about district communication committee changes? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. It says uh, the manager slash administrators. Town manager slash administrators. Right. Um, does it have to be at least one? Or does, do we have to, does each town have to have an administrator, its administrator be a member? No. That's why they had asked us to put in the at least one in front of finance committee members. Okay. So the intent is not to require. Correct. Not required. It's not an, at least one. Okay. So it's only at least one select person and only at least one finance committee member. The others are optional. So the number of town managers, administrators, the number of school committee members, the number of superintendents. That was a joke. Um, okay. That show up is discretionary. Any qualms with these changes? <laughs> okay. Next section, incurring of debt. I'm thinking Paul Mayette for this one. I'm handing around some, some new language on this. Um, so Paul pointed out this morning, um, and in consultation with Brian, that we actually um, have the option of using two different sets of Mass General Law for incurring debt. And we have done that in the past. And um, the, all the sample language that Dusty had um, given us for this section only referenced Section D. So they have two requirements for us, basically. One, that we reference MGL, which was not currently done or was not done previously in this language, and that we also reference the approval, the process of approval by, um, by town meetings. So um, I would recommend we're gonna strike what we had put in here, which was the, the sample language that Dusty had previously given us, which was just around chapter 71, section 16D. The new language has in there section, um, chapter 71, section 16D or N to be decided at the time that the district is incurring debt, which is the way that the district has done it in the past. So D basically, we don't have this, the, oh, D is what's listed in the, in the document. Yes. Right. D, D was the was the, the sample language that Desi had given us. That's what you have there? Yep. And then Paul said, wait a minute, is that right? right. This morning. Thank you. <laughs> and we said, and, yeah. Right. 60 <laughs> days goes by and, and debt gets approved. Yep. So section N, which we don't have the language of in front of you, as Nurse just said, it basically talks about what we do now. It goes on a town warrant. It's approved. It's, it's got to be approved in each member town. Doesn't talk about debt overrides because that's that's a separate thing. That's how the town chooses to fund it, right? If you know, and, um, we could have a situation where one town could afford a capital cost within their budget, and then the two towns couldn't. Everyone still has to approve the debt. Two towns would have to do an override. The other could cover the costs. So. So I'm confused. Confused too. What do mm -hmm. you have? So our recommendation, and, and I apologize, we should put up pulled MGL, which I wasn't thinking of. This has been ongoing through the day today, um, is that we use the language, both sets of the language that's in the new sheet um, to substitute in in place of this section. So the language we had there does not qualify. about section 16? Yeah, chapter 71, <coughs> section 16, D or N. The language of D is what is, is written right there in the actual so regional agreement. Of D, so where it says the incurring of debtedness yeah. down through shall not be incurred, yeah. that is section D. And section D is now your, oh. section D is now being proposed on this sheet of paper, strike everything here and use this. So not section D. So rather than saying we're gonna use section D, which is what's listed here in summary, we issue the committee votes debt. You have 60 days to hold a committee meeting to say no to, or a town meeting to say yes or no to. That's D. Rather than saying D or N, which in a lot of legalese basically says what we're doing now, it's voted, it's sent to member towns, it goes on town warrants, it's approved by all towns. The language in these two combined <coughs> on this sheet would strike what's. That's what I just asked. <laughs> and yes. That was the answer I was looking for. Yes. So this got printed at 627 as Narissa was driving and saying, hey, can you print this? 
So, yes. So we can come back to this. This was just, this was literally a, we had something in here, Paul questioned it. I went back to Desi and said, look, we, we've used D and, N, D and N in the past. That's our procedure, right? Is at the time that the district votes the incurring of debt to start that process, to send it on to the towns for a vote, right? We have chosen whether it's going to use D or it's whether it's going to use N. So is it is it going to the 60-day window where you could call a town meeting, or is it going to, I believe it's just a straight ballot, right? No, it's a town, town meeting. Town yeah. meeting. Warrant process. Uh, the war yeah, the warrant process, exactly, in N, right? That's the, the decision that's always been made as the incurring of debt per Mass General Law. That's, you know. And that's called. voted by the school committee. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is, yeah, at the time that that vote is made. So in recent years, we've used N as the, the method to send it on to the town which is the warrant process. Where do you see N? N is in that language, so. No, I mean, the language not. of N is nowhere. Oh, thank you, Damon. So <laughs> what's written here is the language of section 16D. <laughs> the language of 16N is not printed for you. And this language that combined these two paragraphs are basically what I think we've, <laughs> we still have to talk to Desi. I think what we're saying is these become what goes in the regional agreement and it basically provides the option so that when we, if we get to a capital project, the committee, obviously this is all done in concert with the towns, can determine. Because if the towns say, you know what, we don't want to hold a town meeting, we just want to let the 60 days go. Great, we'll vote, you know, the committee votes this mm -hmm. under section D. D, and then you don't have to hold a town meeting and incur the costs that would come along with that, so right? It allows the Otherwise decision you're forced to be made to. Right. based on. So you need both of these. Those would be. Those That's would what's be. always, uh, yes, yes, yeah. So we're, so we're coming back on the 29th for DCC. So the hope is, I think everything else we've had, I would call it very much clarity around. Yes. So if this is the one thing hanging, we can get you language very specific about what we're saying we're going to propose. And what it would mean. It would maybe even uh, you have an opportunity to talk to town council if you want well, to. I'm gonna um, that. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. it's what's today? Today's the ninth. We can get that to you by next week at the very latest. Yes. That gives you a couple weeks, a week and two and a half weeks to quickly ask town council what they would suggest. Is Jesse saying that what, we, what we're proposing is wrong or are they just, they're just suggesting that it be changed? No, our, our existing um, language that we had in there, we need to add at least a reference to MGL and we need to add a reference to um, approvals by, by the towns beyond delivering it to the Board of Selectmen, right? Our current language that's struck in there just basically says we vote it within seven days, we have to get it to each town's Board of Selectmen. There's nothing in there. So they said we need to add the mass general law that, um, that uh, references incurring of debt, which is, is, is that it's chapter crazy. 71 sections, section 16 D or N. And we have to reference the fact that it has has to go through, you know, some approval process, whether that's the we're not going to take any action and that's the approval or whether it's going to go to a vote and that's the approval. So that was their requirements. We said then at that point on our, our call on the 27th, give us some sample language. Tell us what their districts are doing to satisfy that so that we're not making this up, essentially. They gave us the language that's currently in in here, in the red line version. This morning, when Paul raised the question, we, I, and we were talking to, I was talking to Brian, he said, but we don't use just D, which is the only thing that's provided for in that language that they initially gave us. I went back to Michelle Griffin at Desi at that point um, and said to her, we need language that specifies D or N. Do you have that language? And she got back to me this afternoon with the language that you have in front of you on that separate sheet. I think we should take this to our respective towns because yep. this seems like a bigger change. Talk to our town councils and then come back to it later because okay. I don't think, you know, I didn't have enough time to fully get through this before the meeting. Yes. And right now, I just want to eat some dinner. <laughs> and so I just don't think we should belabor this because I, I certainly can't speak for the town of Newbury and accept it right now. Right, right. And we'll get you exactly 
because this is all over the place, because it was just literally off the press uh, 10 minutes before the meeting, we'll get you the specific language with that we're saying will replace section, what is that, 16, yep. incurring of debt. And we'll also get you copies of section the, the actual think, MGL. Uh, we'll get it to you just cleaned up so there's no clarity about what's where and what's not. There's no clarity? <laughs> so there is more clarity. <laughs> well. Ah. Uh, <laughs> he picked me apart. <laughs> I tried. So just to clarify, section 16 now, the way it exists, what's struck, provides no guidance on this, right? So literally, it basically says the committee votes debt and gives it to the selectmen. So, and that's why we've always been able to choose at the time. That's not good, right. So we need more clarity. So it's just, again, none of us are sitting around the table in 30 years. It needs to be clear what the options are. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I hope I'm not here in 30 years either. At least not at this table. I hope I'm still here. But, you know. I'll still be here. All right, so we'll get back to you with language on that, and then we can bring it back to the 29th and have a discussion then about kind of the direction we want to head in unless... If, if somebody's kicking up some major issues, let me know. Uh, can I just say that in between so that if we need to take an intermediate step during the month of January, we can do that? Does that sound good? Yeah. Me and Brian? Yeah. Just a couple of things uh, yeah. to prevent it coming back for nitpicking stuff. On the third line down, I think in all the rest of the document, they just you just refer to the two-thirds fraction vote but not spell it out before. Oh, yeah. Good point. Okay. And then <clears throat> under additional option, uh, second line, I think uh, second and fourth line, uh, in the document elsewhere, they've stricken out the member towns and just have town. No, they had us add member towns. Okay. So, so where it just said town, unless it was specific, like there are a couple of places where I think they had me add in, like withdrawing was the withdrawing town specifically, but other, they had us add in member where it just said towns. So that was an addition, not a subtraction. So I think that one should be okay. But we'll change the two thirds when we get that off to you. All right. Moving on from that section so we can get Damon his dinner. Um, section 17. So there's two pieces to this here. Um, this is the, bless you, application of state and federal grants section. Um, so the first section was application of state grants. Um, state grants are provided for in Mass General Law as far as how we use them um, within our budgetary purposes. So they said this is redundant and should be removed. Um, the section, section federal aid. So I knew Fre Freeman's going to have some, some history on this, I think. There apparently used to be a military installation down Salisbury Beach. Yes? We were never attacked during that period. <laughs> <laughs> it was the but, safest but, but, time. But we are now, right? <laughs> um, so there was a military installation down Salisbury Beach. There were military families that were stationed there. We had the children from those military families in the district, and the state the federal government, the military apparently, kicked us some extra money for those students. And this was written into our regional agreement to account for that money. So what they said is that the last, <laughs> the last vestiges of cleanup or whatever was like in 1993. Yeah. But remember this agreement was originally the, the Union 68, so it was Triton Junior Senior High. So I believe this goes back to the, the 1967 original agreement. So we don't have exact details of when the, the base disappeared. You didn't know about it, Freeman? I think it went back to the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes sense why it's in our agreement. I know. I, I did <gasps> that is. Really? So they recommended Stop for those secret. two reasons. So um, one should definitely go because MGL covers it, and this is what's here is not accurate anymore because we have to follow MGL. But the second one they said is just basically useless, so they recommended striking that entire section because it just doesn't apply anymore. Okay. <laughs> then we'll rewrite something, I guess, right? <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> All right. Um, and the rest of it here, under jurisdiction and severability of section, this is just the same stuff that we've been doing. It's updating language to be present tense. It's um, changing pupils to students, that type of thing. There's no major changes in those two. Are no major changes in those two sections. So you're going to change the pupil in um, jurisdiction to students, right? Yes, you're working off the electronic version. I actually already have that done here because that got picked up during our school committee meeting last night. <laughs> Um, and the same thing if you're working off the electronic version with um, 
the jurisdiction of the regional district school committee will be changed to just the jurisdiction of the committee. Yep. Okay. Last minute comments or questions? Okay. All right. So we'll get you that information on the incurring of debt section. We're going to clean this up based on all the comments and that were made here tonight and the things that were decided to accept or not accept. Um, we'll get a, I think we're going to, we hadn't talked about this. Are we going to consolidate? I'm guessing we're going to consolidate our, the work that we had already done, right, with the work that's done here and get a nice clean version and those two sets of changes? Yes. Yes, yes we are. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's our intent is to get all of that done so that you have a nice clean version other than the incurring of debt section perhaps when we come back on um, the 29th. So does that make sense now we're clear enough about the original changes and these new changes so you can see it all in one document? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then yes, we will. But we'll do the incurring of debt separate. We'll give you that chunk. That will be what? That will be what? Red. Red? It no, will probably saying, be we'll, a separate document. I'm saying put on a separate sheet of paper just so that you can say this is, we're saying this is the new section 17. <coughs> Take it to council, town administrators, whatever. Gotcha. Oh. Okay. Well, thank you for all for your time tonight. I really appreciate you coming out because we wouldn't have wanted to be starting um, whatever we have to do on January 29th right now. Um, so I think that's it, and we'll see you on January 29th. Thank you all. Yes.